Think Forward. Think Research Channel. The opinions expressed in the following program are strictly those of the speakers. They do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. From the National Science Foundation, where discoveries begin, this is Frontier. Discussions of today's most exciting research subjects by distinguished scientists and engineers working at the frontiers of knowledge. Working in rocks more than 375 million years old, far above the Arctic Circle, paleontologists have discovered a remarkable new fossil species. It represents the most compelling evidence yet of an intermediate evolutionary stage between fish and early limbed animals. Jokingly called a fishapod, the animal was part fish and part early limbed creature, a tetrapod. We begin Frontier today with a lighthearted look at the discovery, a video segment produced for school children by the National Science Foundation. It's followed by a presentation by Neil Shubin and Ted Dashler, who made this fascinating discovery. Life made its debut in the water a few billion years ago and went through some pretty wacky designs before the first air breathers, probably insects, evolved. Then somehow, around 400 million years ago, the first vertebrates, creatures with backbones, got a leg up on land, at least for brief visits. Nobody's sure what they look like, but it may have been a critter with flippers that could function as feet at the water's edge. Scientists recently found just such a fossil in an ancient rock. It had teeth like a crocodile, snout and scales like a fish, and sturdy limb-like fins. The rest, as they say, is history. To begin with, I want to set uh, this discovery in the context of the history of life, but also back up a little bit and look at it in the history of this uh, research program that, that Neil and I have been collaborating on for a number of years now. A, a spindle diagram is a fairly simple way to look at vertebrate history. On the left side here is geologic time from the present all the way back to the Cambrian 500 plus million years ago. And we can look at the history of vertebrate groups. And remember, this is only the last 10% of Earth history or so, um, by, the, by these spindles. And basically, the width of the spindle giving some indication of the diversity. So if we look today at the present, our vertebrates are dominated by ray-finned fishes and tetrapods. We're, we're one of the tetrapods on Earth today. And if we go back in time, back into the age of dinosaurs, we still were dominated by ray-finned fish and tetrapods. But if we drop all the way back into the Paleozoic era, and specifically the, the Devonian period, we see that, that the history of vertebrates were sort of sorting themselves out at the time. Among these more sort of experiments in early fishes, you have jawless forms and placoderms. Uh, jawless forms only represented today by hagfish and lamprey. Um, you have these placoderms are extinct now, acanthodians are extinct now, very beginnings of ray-finned fish. The lobe-finned fish were an important group in the Devonian, a, a much more diverse group than they are today. Today we only have the lungfish and the coelacanth. But tetrapods, all limbed animals, were just getting their start in the late part of the Devonian period. And in fact, Neil and I have focused on the segment uh, basically from about 365 million years ago to about 385 million years ago. And it's a very consequential time in the history of vertebrates, the history of life on Earth. It's when we still had some of these early experiments, and they were, they were going through and, and uh, uh, surviving, and sort of the, exper the sorting out process was going on. Um, but it was the beginning of many of these, of these groups that would come to dominate vertebrates, especially the ray-finned fish and the early tetrapods. Now, this isn't particularly an evolutionary diagram, 
But what we're going to be talking about today is, is the connection between lobe-finned fish and the earliest tetrapods. And that's, uh, that's where Tiktaalik fits in in this story. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that life on Earth has a lot to do with what's going on around it. And if we just look at something in a, a similar diagram, but the history of vascular plants, plants that might be uh, beginning to establish themselves on land, you'll see that the late Devonian period was also very consequential. And it's, it's no coincidence that plants were establishing themselves on land a little before and at the same time that vertebrates were beginning to find a, a foothold in freshwater ecosystems and, and eventually on land. And actually, I'm very pleased to see Dick Bierbauer here. Dick is one of those people who's uh, made a career of thinking about this um, origin of life into terrestrial settings on Earth. Uh, so this is all part of the picture. Here's a road cut in Pennsylvania. This is where I started work in the Devonian. Back in uh, the early 1990s, I thought I'd go back to school. Neil was a professor at Penn, and I, um, Neil suggested that uh, I look at the Catskill Formation, a, a late Devonian group of rocks in Pennsylvania. A few fossils had been found in the past, some of them interesting, but mostly um, there you'd find fish scrap, bits and pieces, and, and nothing that you could really sink your teeth into um, phylogenetically and such. Um, you notice a lot of Pennsylvania is covered by forests, like this hillside here, so we really do depend on PennDOT, the highway department, and, and in the 90s there was a lot of highway construction work. So I, I benefited from uh, all of the highway construction. This is particularly up in the north central part of Pennsylvania. Uh, route 15, which is the north-south corridor, was being improved. This is along Route 15. But in general, Pennsylvania has a, quite a bit of Devonian rock. This bluish color uh, is all Devonian rock in this geological map of Pennsylvania. But we're, we're actually focusing on particular paleo environments within the Catskill Formation. And as we've explored through the, all of the Catskill Formation that, that we can find exposed in Pennsylvania, it's out here in the north central part that we seem to be getting, getting into the parts of these ancient fluvial systems, the meander belts, the swampy habitats, um, where a lot of the fishes that have been, uh, particularly lobe finned fishes and early limbed animals that we were most interested in, uh, seem to occur. So our, our um, area of fieldwork has basically focused up in Clinton and Lycoming and Tioga County in Pennsylvania. Actually from this road cut, from this debris, that they make this big road cut, and of course we're not there as they're blowing up this rock, but then they spread it out for these new road beds. This was actually a cut that was done uh, right about 1990, so a couple of years before we started the work. But right on a slab of rock, right in here, not obvious at first, was this is an example. This is a, a, a fin of a lobe fin fish that was found along that road cut. If we, here's the, the specimen, here's a line drawing to help you differentiate the bones above. But I'm a lobe fin fish and this is my front fin. So all the same bones essentially that are in the proximal parts of my fin, a humerus, a radius, an ulna, some bones that you might interpret as, um, as wrist-like bones, are present in these lobe-finned fish. Yet this fish still clearly has long rods. In fact, these rods that we see as small bones here would, would stretch out further. Still a fish living in an aquatic setting, uh, but experimenting with new fin designs. These lobe-finned fish had a, had a toolkit, an internal skeleton, which allowed them to start experimenting with living in shallow freshwater environments using their fins to manipulate on the, the bottom, maybe through swampy habitats, whatever the scenario might be. And this cartoon here is just to, to bring home that point that, that in evolution, um, oftentimes it's features that develop for one purpose, in this case for a fish manipulating in shallow freshwater and settings, that become useful for another purpose when there's a new ecological opportunity. And so, in this case, with fish playing baseball, and then the baseball comes out of the water, what are you going to do? You're going to use those structures in a, in a new way. This is the site where we've spent most of our time in Pennsylvania. It's called Red Hill, Clinton County. Uh, specimens had been found from here in the past. Once we got back there and started looking, we, we started to find 
more than we, we could have ever hoped for. It's a sequence of the upper part of the Catskill Formation, the deposits of stream systems uh, from about here all the way through these. These are all paleo soil horizons. So you had a big alluvial plain, plants around, uh, tree-like plants on the, on the alluvial plain, a lot of vegetation, soils developing, but also streams going back and forth across that alluvial plain. And from this site, we've actually gotten a huge diversity of vertebrates in this case, everything from a, a variety of placoderms and then the acanthodian fishes. So most think back to that spindle diagram, we actually have examples of all those different groups from the Devonian, except for jawless fishes at this point in time. I should mention this is Fomenian in age, which is the latest part of the late Devonian. Um, down into the lobe finned, actually early ray finned fish here, down into the lobe finned fishes, and even uh, bits and pieces of some very early tetrapods. So uh, equivalent to some of the earliest stuff in the world. But along with those at this same site, we're also finding we have a, a new kind of arachnid from the site, a new kind of millipede. Uh, these are from specific uh, sort of special depositional environments, what we think is a small pond. Actually, it's green beds right down through here. Um, and also a whole, whole bunch of uh, different plants. So clearly there was a diversity of vascular plants. The most abundant are these progymnosperms, which were the forest formers on these floodplains. So a great diversity of things. And actually with that kind of, that kind of uh, range of things from a single site, you can go ahead and, and make a reconstruction like this. And so everything from plants and some sort of physical setting for this floodplain, uh, as well as a range of the, the vertebrates, not all of which are, are pictured here. But the important message here is you may, you may picture yourself swimming or, or fishing in an environment like this. And uh, although the cast of characters have changed, those are different plants, those are different organisms than you'd find today, essentially the ecosystem had a, it was the beginning of the development of a modern aspect ecosystem, uh, sp sp specifically a terrestrial ecosystem continental ecosystem with plants being the primary producers, supplying detritus into the streams, with detritus eaters, with, with uh, carnivores eating the detritus eaters and all the rest on up a food chain. So this was the first time in Earth history, in this, this middle and late part of the Devonian, that you actually were establishing these um, freshwater ecosystems and they included the earliest limbed animals. Again, not a coincidence. Speaking of earliest limbed animals, this is something from that site, the Red Hill site. <laughs> Just a, it's a particularly well-preserved humerus, upper arm bone of a early tetrapod. It has many of the features which clearly indicate it's from a limbed animal versus a fin, especially a lobe fin fish. Um, and when we did the research on this, it was particularly informative for a sort of the structure and function of the earliest limbed animals. But what we see is that uh, from sites like Red Hill and other sites within the Catskill Formation, we're beginning to see the earliest limbed animals. Now, I mentioned that we're interested in the connection between lobe fin fish and tetrapods. So think back to that spindle diagram, the line that would connect the lobe fin fish spindle to the tetrapod spindle would pass through a stem lineage like this. And on this end, we clearly have these different lobe fin fish, cartoons below and the, the, the pectoral fin skeleton above with homologous bones colored similarly. Um, and we've been finding material down in this ilk of things here in Pennsylvania. And we've been finding material up in this ilk, but we still had trouble. We still saw fish. We still saw tetrapods. We just wanted to see okay, where, how can we fill this gap? When, how are we going to learn the way that these most, these fishes here that are certainly beginning to act like tetrapods, certainly beginning to show some of the early features of tetrapods, limbed animals. Um, but what were, the, what were some of the transitional forms before you got into something that you'd call a full-fledged tetrapod? So in other words, what's the gray area here? Neil and I wanted to find out. And among the things, um, at my office back in Philadelphia, I had a book on the shelf. I had used it at Franklin and Marshall College when I was an undergraduate in historical geology. And we opened it up to the page on the late Devonian, showing the late Devonian deposits in North America. 
and clearly saw, okay, there's the red beds which we had been studying, part of the Catskill project. We've uh, sort of, okay, been there, done that. Uh, there's these East Greenland late Devonian red beds, well studied by Swedes going back into the 1930s, um, and collections still being studied today by, by um, people in Europe. Uh, but we also noticed that there was this clastic wedge, this sequence of, of, of Devonian, late Devonian stream deposits here in the uh, Arctic Islands in, in uh, what's now called Nunavut. And with some background work of the geology, we learned uh, that the rocks had been well studied, the stratigraphy was understood, uh, the rocks were actually compared uh, to rocks of the Catskill Formation. Um, they were the right age, uh, mostly a little bit older than the Catskill Formation, which was something we were interested in looking at. So we got it in our heads that we would uh, get up there and try to do some work up there. And the logistics of getting up there are, are just, just a little complicated. They took a lot of time. This is, this is Nunavut, which in 1999 became a territory of Canada. It's an it's a, um, Inuit homeland. And it's, uh, it's a landmass, or put all the landmasses together, it's about the size of California. There's about 30,000 people live there. The capital is down here, Akaluit, which used to be called Frobisher, on Frobisher Bay, so Baffin Island. Most of Nunavut is above the Arctic Circle, which runs here. Um, we can take a jet up to Resolute, Resolute Bay, and then we get logistical support to get up onto southern Ellesmere Island and off into these areas. And this is where there's Devonian rock. All that we really had to go on at first was a map, or maps like this, but with more precision. This red outlines essentially this Devonian clastic wedge in the high Arctic islands. We actually started as sort of, uh, was a matter of permitting and sort of some serendipity. Our first year we started out here on these islands and uh, by using aerial photos and maps, got put into areas where we expected to find Devonian rock, and late Devonian rock, and certainly we did, but looking at the rock and looking at the animals we found there, we realized we might have been a little too far oceanward, sort of in a marginal setting um, in these ancient stream deposits. We found good fossils, there, there's, there's a lot of science to be done on the fossils we found out here, but we were really after those non-marine type rocks. So, in the, so you see we're out there in 99, in 2000 we got onto southern Ellesmere Island and we've been there ever since. It was just the kind of rocks we were after. Um, and this is why. Um, the rocks of the right age. We were able to locate the, the areas where they were the right kinds of rocks uh, for, for our studies. And they're fairly well exposed. And it's just a matter of, of getting there. And that's, that's the challenge. And so the logistics, once we get, take the commercial flights up to Resolute Bay, Polar Continental Shelf Project, which is part of um, uh, Natural Resources Canada, uh, supports research teams all over the Arctic, uh, particularly during the summer months. And they, they charter a few of these planes, and we provide them with our needs six months or so before we go up there. They put us on Twin Otter planes, which can land us out on Ellesmere Island, on, on beaches, gravel beaches, and that sort of thing. And also, uh, Bell 206 helicopters, which can then shuttle us up into the valleys where we need to go. So really, the logistics are not too difficult. Uh, works pretty smoothly, thanks to the, the, the people there at uh, Polar Continental Shelf Project. Um, so we're up for five or six weeks at a time. I like to point out that only 100 years before were the first people who actually did some of this geology and actually collected some fossils. This is the Fram expedition, a Norwegian expedition they were there from 1898 to 1902. I love to tell my wife that, yo, I'm gone six weeks, they were gone four years. They took their Fram, which was built so it wouldn't get crushed in the ice, the ship Fram, and they stayed frozen into the ice for eight months of the winter and then sailed and mapped and collected fossils and did botany and some other things during the, uh, during the short summer up there. And logistically, we, we get into the areas that, that we've identified with aerial photos and maps. We, we will each take our own personal tent and a little bit away, we'll put a, a larger cook tent. There's the, always the potential of polar bears, so we keep the food away from, from where we're sleeping. Um, this is on southern Ellesmere Island at Goose Fjord. Actually, an arrow will pop in up there. That's, that's the vicinity that we're at for this, this slide. 
Um, it's light all summer. We're usually there from the end of June into early August. Um, it's usually, this is pretty typical of weather, kind of misty, sleety, uh, above freezing, you know, freezing to about um, 45, uh, 50 when the sun comes out or so. Um, so as long as we're well prepared with the right kinds of uh, equipment and, and clothing and all the rest, we're in good shape. Uh, typical of the work we do when we get into an area, we essentially set out prospecting, which is looking for the fragments of fossils. And we'll, we'll scour, we'll walk back and around a, a surface like this. By the way, this is Goose Fjord, the frozen fjord. And actually, the Fram Formation spent two winters frozen in at Goose Fjord, a little down uh, the fjord from where these pictures are taken. Um, but um, when we do begin to find fossil fragments, then we'll do an excavation, anything from a small excavation, the, the size of this podium, to a larger one, and that's what we'll be showing you later on. Actually, this is a map from that Fram expedition. Here's Goose Fjord. See these little crossed picks? We're, this picture is actually taken right here, so we were actually collecting on the same rocks that, that the Fram had worked on exactly a century before. And we were essentially following up. We were the first people following up on what they had done. It only took 100 years. Uh, right here, um, this, uh, this is Jason Downs, who uh, uh, just graduated from Yale and actually is a postdoc now with, with, with Neil and I. Um, but we're working on a, uh, a placoderm called Bothriolepis at this particular site. And a, a nice head shield came out there. This is the valley where we've actually spent most of our time now. It's the Fram Formation, named after the ship. It essentially, the strata here, you can see dipping off to the right, uh, we're about at the Middle Devonian to Late Devonian boundary when we're down here. And the Fram spans, oh, let's say the first four to five million years of the Late Devonian. So we're looking at the early part of the Late Devonian, if that makes sense. And we actually had established a camp up in the valley up here and spent the next days, weeks, uh, climbing and walking all the exposures in this Fram formation. By the way, you notice the way you have these ledges and things. The ledges are harder sandstones, in this case representing channel sands. These are the deposits of meandering stream systems uh, and all the little sub-depositional uh, settings that come with meandering stream systems. But it turned out one place in particular became the, our real, uh, real bonanza for us. It was the 17th site that we found in the year 2000. And as with most fossil sites, it uh, started one day where, here's one of our team people. Um, this is actually from up above on that same ridge that we just saw that arrow pointing to. And unbeknownst to me when I took this picture, but it turns out that all across this area here were weathered fragments of fossils. Lots of reasonably large, good size pieces of fossils. And uh, one of our team members came back to camp that day, I never made it down onto that, that ridge, that nose. Came back to camp with pockets full of these things, and we all said, okay, we're going back tomorrow. And indeed we did, and as a group, the first thing we do is collect all the small material off the surface. And it was clear this was a, somewhere there was a very productive layer. And by sort of climbing up the hill here and collecting all the small pieces, eventually you don't see any more small pieces, so you can assume that the layer that is producing all those pieces is just where you stop seeing things. And indeed, we were able to identify the productive layer that all of this material had come out of. By the way, the kinds of things we pick up on the surface collecting are the more durable parts of these skeletons. For example, lungfish tooth plates uh, by the dozens. Um, and they're very durable both pre-depositionally or, or during deposition. They'll survive as a skull is tumbled through a stream system or, or whatever. But also taphonomically, uh, after it's been exposed, uh, most of the delicate pieces will be broken up and we'll only find these sorts of things. So we had located this site, uh, NV2K7, and the next time we went back uh, in the year 2002, although we, we did a few different camps, we thought we need to really start to develop, excavate at NV2K17. And of course it started with fairly small tools and following back that layer, but the layers are dipping into the hillside here, so we actually prepared enough to have a, a gas-powered jackhammer with us also. And here we've now taken off a wedge of rock. The fossiliferous zone is maybe about a foot below 
Uh, this is Corwin Sullivan, a, a, a graduate student at, at Harvard, about a foot below, so down through here. Marcus Davis, a, a graduate student, now postdoc at University of Chicago, and myself. And so once we, ex once we took off the overburden, we could begin to nibble away on the edge of the fossiliferous zone. And the, for example, right in here is a skull of a rather large lobe fin fish that has now been consolidated. It has a hardener on it to keep the pieces together. We'll cover it with plaster. So all along this edge that we're nibbling away at, we're finding more and more well-preserved fossil material now. Not the things that got washed out by erosion and broken apart, but actually complete articulated and associated material as it was buried 375-ish million years ago. And the process just goes through a stage like this. These are plaster jackets. When we do find the fossil with the broken skull material or, or, or whatever part of the fossil we want to collect, <laughs> we leave it in the rock, we cover it with plaster, eventually dig below it and take off this plaster like taking the cap off a mushroom, then add more plaster to the bottom. And these are all jackets that we have now totally made a cocoon, a plaster cocoon, essentially. And um, the, the animal that is most common at the site is a large lobe fin fish called Lacognathus. It's a, it's a porolipiform sarcopterygian, not particularly close to the origin of tetrapods, still of interest, though. There was one particular jacket, and in fact, it's that little one there that we had collected from right over in this area here that turned out to have something very interesting. We really didn't know it was so interesting until we got home. It's a small fragment, uh, about six inches long. Um, this is the view that we saw in the field. Actually, we just saw this sort of pallet part. We're looking at it from below here, from above, and from the side. And after staring at it and, and people commenting on it, we realized that what we had was what's outlined in red here, part of the snout of a very interesting group of lobe fin fishes, um, a very rare group of lobe fin fishes. Uh, called pandericthids or Alpistus stegalids. This is a form that was known from just two very fragmentary specimens of the top of a skull from the Escuminac Formation further south in Canada. But it did allow us to say, okay, we have found what we're after. We have found the animal, uh, we have found an example of an animal that is related to some things we already know. These, these um, pandericthids were always thought to be the closest animals to, for closest fish to limbed animals, but we really, we hope that what we found might provide more information about that grade of lobe fin fish. And just to quickly review, and, and my last slide here, if we go back in time, and uh, geologists can create these paleogeographic maps, so this is what the Earth looked like from space in, in the late Devonian, if you could look at it all at once, by the way. But part of it is this landmass here, which is referred to as the Euro-American landmass, it includes most of North America, I mean all, except for parts like Florida that eventually got assembled from elsewhere, Greenland, and parts of Eastern Europe, as well as uh, Scotland and, and British Isles and things. So this Euro-American landmass sat straddling the equator. And by the way, our, our rocks that we're working in in the Arctic actually would sit just up in here, so hence not near, you know, a much more tropical, subtropical probably climate than we see here today. These are a lot of the southern continents, Australia and Antarctica and Africa and South America. But importantly, these animals that we could start to compare that snout to were very limited. One was Elpistostegi, as I said, known from, from fragmentary material from the Escuminac Formation in Canada, in, uh, Gaspe Peninsula area, which would sit there. Importantly, Pandericthes, known from <laughs> Latvia particularly, from some very nice specimens. Um, again, a flattened skull with the eyes sitting high on the skull. Um, some features which for years had made it the best candidate for the lobe fin fish very close to early tetrapods. So to this list, we could now add this Fram formation, Elpistus stegalian. And at this point, all we had was that snout but we knew that this was going to be the, hopefully leading to, to something bigger. And that's where we'll put, put Neil on to talk about the rest. Okay. The 2004, so far this has taken us to 2002. We entered the 2004 field season really knowing we were onto something. We had a locality that preserved skeletons. It preserved Elpistus stegalids or pandericthids. These were exactly what we were after. So now our focus became that NV2K17 site. 
And so this shows you how far we've taken in the last few years, just to give you a sense. This is taken from across a stream of about half a mile away. That is the NV2K17 uh, site right there. We removed a lot of rock. And when we removed a lot of rock, what we did is we found lots of skeletons. And the way these things are preserved as, as articulated skeletons, like that creature there, but also sometimes as a slurry almost, as almost a flow of things just that are preserved jack straw, either partially associated, articulated, or sometimes even isolated. So a, a challenge really became finding individual specimens of this pandirichthid, elpistus tagalod, what have you, um, in 2004. The most remarkable um, time of my field career in 25 years of doing this, and I, I, I think Ted shares this as well, is the first four days of the field season in 2002 in July. Within the first five days, we discovered three specimens of this creature. This was one of the best, discovered by Steve Gatesy, who I'm unfortunately only see part of him here, and Ferris Jenkins over here. But see this little area here? Here's the rock. This is the bone. What you're seeing is the snout of a creature. Keep that creature in mind, because that creature is this one. It was a flat-headed animal, and it was coming out of the rock at us. So we knew that if we had any luck, given the preservation, we could follow this thing all the way in and hopefully get either a good chunk of the skeleton or the whole thing itself. This was wonderful. This was in the third or fourth day of the field season, and we already had three of these specimens on there, so I'm not showing you now. Now our worry became something else altogether. Anybody who's ever worked in the polar regions knows weather's unpredictable, logistical support is often tenuous, getting this material out on helicopters and twins, twin otters, uh, represents a challenge. And so our challenge became removing this material. And that particular season, we had all kinds of sleet and snow and lousy weather, and, so that, and we wrap our fossils in plaster, bad combination, our plaster never dried. Uh, Ted got the great idea to, make a, to set up one of our little mini satellite tent uh, camps, uh, tents, and with a stove inside, and that helped us a little bit getting the, uh, getting the materials uh, dried off, and so we can, could transport this the several hundred miles back to, uh, back to, back to PCS, the Polar Continental Shelf base. And the way they go is in a sling often underneath, so obviously uh, the having sturdy plaster is very important. Sometimes they're in the back seat here, so it's, this transportation problem is really an issue. We really have to make decisions about what, uh, what comes home, what stays. It's not, it's not very easy. Anyway, so we get this material home, the jackets are opened up, and I think the fall of 2004 was really remarkable because every week or so more of these creatures were exposed. Remember I showed you that slide of Steve Gates and Ferris Jenkins, there's like a little thing I called a snout, which you couldn't really tell probably from where you're sitting. As rocks were removed at home, we started to see this. Here's two orbits and a flat head. Something funny was going on. It was clearly, you know, we were onto it. And it was prepared more, and you could see the flat head, and then the body was preserved. This, uh, over time, was exposing itself uh, quite beautifully. To give you a sense of what's all important here, let me just show you, let me just review. Here's a textbook slide taken from Len Radinsky's textbook in 1987. This is sort of the state of the art in 1987. Here's a Devonian age fish known as Eustenopteron. Here's a reconstruction of a Devonian age uh, tetrapod, limbed animal, uh, known as Ichthyostega. And this gives you the broad brush comparison between fish and early tetrapod. These things have conical heads with eyes on the side, just like a fish. These early amphibians or early tetrapods have flat heads with eyes on top. They have these big notches on the back where ear region would develop. Fish don't have shoulders. You see how the head is connected to the sh uh, fish don't have necks where the head is connected to the shoulder. So if you bend your, want to bend your head, you have to bend your body. Whereas tetrapods, just like we are tetrapods, have necks where the head can move independently. So conical heads, flat heads, uh, no neck, necks. These guys have fins. These guys have limbs. These guys have scales on their back. These guys don't have scales on their back. Because you're, there's a long list of characters by which fish differ from amphibians and tetrapods. Here's the new fish shown here. It has scales on its back, like a fish. It has fin webbing, like a fish. It has a flat head like pandirichthids and early tetrapods with eyes on top. It has a neck where the head can move independently of the shoulders. And most amazingly is inside this fin are functional shoulder, elbow, and even wrist joints. And it's that functional wrist joint which is, is particularly important in understanding uh, the invasion of land, the origin of land living animals. So it's a real mosaic, a hybrid, if you will, between fish uh, and amphibians. Found at just the right time where we would predict, we'd have predicted it. So the, story of the textbook story is this creature, so here's a fish, here's Eustenopteron, here's an early tetrapod, here's our creature. Like a lobefin fish, it has fins of a, of a particular type, scales and very primitive jaws. Like a land-living animal, it has a neck, has a 
fin with wrist bones, has a, uh, that, fun that are functional wrist bones, has a flat head, and I'll, I'll show you later, expanded ribs. Now, when we first saw this thing in the laboratory, we were really excited, and we knew it was going to be important, so we needed a name. And we, needed, we wanted the name for this thing to represent its provenance, that it was discovered in Inuit territory, that there's a people who live there, and we wanted it to reflect that provenance. So with the help of the Canadian government, we engaged the elders of uh, the territory of Nunavut. This is them. I cannot pronounce the name of their committee, but uh, <laughs> I would try, but I would fail. Uh, and uh, we described the animal to them. I said, um, uh, it's, uh, it's a large freshwater fish. And they said, oh, well, that's a tiktaalik. And I said, well, what's that? And they said, well, it's a nuktatuk for large freshwater fish of a <laughs> particular kind that they have. So that became the generic name uh, for tiktaalik. So we started to prepare these things. And all kinds of interesting features emerged. So here's one of the largest specimens. I should say the size variation of Tiktaalik varies from about four feet long to about nine feet to the biggest animal. <clears throat> here's a ventral or bottom view of the skull. You see the two jaws. This is sort of the, this region here. What we found is as we were preparing these, we found portions of a, here's a shoulder girdle, and here's an arm bone, a humerus, shown in there. So we started to be able to dig away. Once we removed the fin webbing, we started to see parts of the arm, forearm, wrist, and distal, and fingers and toes. And what was remarkable here is, is we had many specimens, three of them, uh, each, several of which preserve fins, um, that preserve the material in three dimensions, which is really remarkable. Furthermore, we were able to take these bones apart, and we have a cast of one of these here, to look at the joint surfaces, look at the shapes of the shoulder, look at the shapes of the wrist, and the shapes of the elbow, and so forth, to begin to understand its function. One of the things really interesting about the critter is it has a humerus, that's an arm bone, has two bones out here, forearm bones, which correspond to radius and ulna, has bones that correspond to wrist bones, and has transverse joints. You see how this joint goes, runs right across? Joint runs right across here. There's bones here and here. In fact, there are probably more bones out here. Has transverse joints that run out the limb. That's essentially what your wrist and metacarpals do. Okay, and, and so this, was, this told us we were onto something. So clearly what we're seeing in this Devonian age late Devonian, uh, these late Devonian specimens, is the beginnings of a pattern of the skeleton which was to dominate the, the appendages of creatures ever since. That is to define the patterns from our arm, where we have a humerus, radius ulna, wrist bones, and fingers, to those of uh, a pterosaur, a bat, a bird. You see the same pattern and again and again. What we're seeing is the origin of this pattern in these Devonian, uh, in De Devonian creatures. As I said, it's really remarkable. So here's the fin, just to show you. What we're able to do is take these bones apart, looking at each of these joints. These are the actual joint surfaces of the shoulder. Here's the shoulder socket. Here's the ball on the humerus. It's actually more complicated than that. Here's the elbow. Here's the, the balls on the end of the humerus, the arm bone. These are the sockets on the radius and ulna, and so forth. By seeing the geometry of these joints and how they're laid on the, on the skeleton itself, we can begin to understand the range of motions that this thing could likely do. And it's really important because it was, this thing was able to accomplish two ex extremes. One is it could function as a subplanar kind of organ, like a fin, like a, like a, like a hydrofoil or a wing. Okay? But if you move the joints around, you can actually get it, and you could see it's actually specialized in some cases, for flexion at the elbow and extension at the wrist. Now, what do I mean by flexion at the elbow, extension at the wrist? What I mean is flexion at the elbow and extension at the wrist. Okay, that's a way of bringing your palm against the ground. Think of when you do a push-up. Okay? So not only were the joints able to accommodate that motion, what's most interesting is when we look, oh, let me go back, when we look at the, um, go back, we look at the side of the, the belly side of the, of the appendage, what we find is there are larger muscle scars on the surfaces that we would imagine that would have supported a push-up activity. Okay, so here we have a fish that was able to do a form of a push-up. So here's a reconstruction of the skeleton of uh, Tiktaalik. We have um, up, into, up to now, we have uh, the, the skulls of several creatures. We have shoulders and fins of several creatures. We have ribs, which actually imbricate. They actually overlap one another, um, suggesting this thing may have been load-bearing. We also have a hind fin, which is very poorly preserved, but that's the only evidence of the hind fin we have. We don't really have many know much about the internal bones, and we don't know about the tail of Tiktaalik yet. We went back in 2006, this past summer, to find more materials, and, and preparation of that is underway. It's, it takes a long time to get this material out. 
some of the really interesting details of Tiktaalik um, come down to understanding how bits of its shoulder and skull and, 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 and bones fit together. And what it shows is what a wonderful intermediate this is between tetrapod and fish. I'm going to show you a series here between here's a fish, Eustenoptera, and Ceripterus. There's a two Devonian fish. Here's Tiktaalik, and here's Acanthostega. What you're looking at is the shoulder. And you're looking at the shoulder from the outside. So this is the socket here, where the humerus, the arm bone, would have fit in. What you'll notice is the socket is facing out towards you. What that means is the arm is projecting outside, laterally outside the body, like a crocodile. That differs from the, the situation of most Devonian fish, where the socket faces backwards. That is, the fin faces mostly backwards. In Tiktaalik, what you find is an intermediate condition, where you're finding a much more lateral, uh, or sideways, uh, it's sort of intermediate between the backwards and the lateral, ba the lateral in Acanthostega and the backwards in Eustenopteron. It's an intermediate in that form. Likewise, if you look at the shoulder internally, so look at the internal surface of it, what you'll find is tetrapods, these early amphibians, have a large plate, which we call the coracoid, which is extending out towards you. Early fish <laughs> don't. Tiktaalik is actually kind of intermediate in this regard, in the sense that it has a very large plate, but it's, this portion of the shoulder is not as big as, as a tetrapod, so it's sort of intermediate in that regard. If we look at the arm bone, the humerus, this is the arm bone here in the belly side, again, it's intermediate. Tetrapods have this sort of arm bone where the uh, the joints for the elbow face out distally, away from the animal. Whereas fish, like this thing Eustenopteron, a Devonian fish, the joints are actually rise up higher on the, um, on the humerus, and that relates to how these, these limb bones stick out from the fin. Tiktaalik is much more like Acanthostag, an early tetrapod in this regard, than it is a Eustenopteron. And it, but yet it still retains some primitive, it, overall though, it still looks like Eustenopteron rather than Acanthostag. This is just a long way for me to say that if you look at the details of this thing, what you find is it's a mosaic between early amphibian, early tetrapod, and Devonian fish. And we can repeat this comparison for many groups, uh, add different kinds of fish to this comparison, add features, and so forth. And the end result of this is that if we take the tree, the evolutionary or phylogenetic tree that Ted showed you earlier, it's unambiguous that Tiktaalik fits in right here between what we would think of as finned animals, like fish, and limbed animals like Acanthostega, Ichthyostega, Tularpeton, amphibians, reptiles, and so forth. So in the last uh, five, six months, we've been working with local schools. Here's Ms. Philbin's third grade class of Manchester, Vermont. They did a paper mache model of Tiktaalik. Um, <laughs> they do you know, sort of pseudo expeditions and so forth. So we've been working with schools in Chicago and other teachers who've contacted us and they're trying to deliver lesson plans and content. And this is the kind of outreach and broader impact that was sort of given to us by the, sort of the, the way that Tiktaalik got out in the, in the popular media. And it struck us that we needed to provide lesson plans for, um, for uh, teachers and so forth. And one thing we, we really rushed to do was to get a website up on Tiktaalik um, where people can explore the discovery itself. That is one of the stories behind this is that science is not a linear process. What did we do? We started in 19, we discovered this whole thing from a textbook, okay? Then what we did is in 1999, led an expedition, we tried and failed, but we learned from our failures. So science isn't this direct A and to B, to C. It's you try, you fail, you learn from your failures, you try again, you fail, you try again, and, you know, and, and so forth. And so the story of Tiktaalik we've been trying to get out is the, the act of doing science, of discovering, um, and, but also how it's an entree to broader problems of geoscience and evolutionary biology, you know, the earth and life. And one thing we also felt responsible for in our broader impacts was really the local community. You'll notice there's oh, the English, 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 English. What is that? That's a Nuktatuk. We decided that the, the, the website should also have an Nuktatuk focus as well. That is, we wanted to get into the local schools there. So if you click on the site, what you'll find is that each of the pages is also in the Nuktatuk language. This conveys two messages. Not only is it being used by the schools in Nunavut, but also to our colleagues. It, it, it conveys a sense that you know, we, we feel this responsibility in, in doing the science that we do. OK, so I just wanted to close with some thank yous. First, I'll thank people. Ted and I will thank you. Come on, come on. Uh, first, we'll thank people, then we'll thank institutions. Ted, neither Ted nor I would be standing here talking to you today if it wasn't for the scientific staff who really made this possible. 
Fred Mollison, his picture here, is the preparator at the Academy of Natural Sciences. Fred prepared much of the material that you saw. Uh, Kaiopi Moneos is an artist at the University of Chicago. Kaiopi's done many of the images you've probably seen on, uh, of Tiktaalik. Bob Masick is our preparator at Chicago. Uh, Bob worked on the fin, the one I showed you before. And then Tyler Keeler, who's our sculptor, who's done um, some of the sculptures you've seen of, uh, of Tiktaalik out there. Finally, we'd be remiss in not thanking our, the institutions who've supported our work financially, logistically, and, and otherwise. The National Science Foundation with our Collaborative Research Awards, the Academy of Natural Sciences and uh, University of Chicago, National Geographic Society, an anonymous donor to the Academy of Natural Sciences, University of Chicago, Harvard University, particularly my colleague Faris Jenkins, the Canadians who provide cost recovery support through Polar Continental Shelf Project, and then the Nunavut community and government which has given us the permits and uh, the ability to work there. Thank you very much. <laughs>um, for example, deliver drugs right to say a, a tumor, right to cancer, so that you would be more be able to be much more effective in treating the cancer and much safer when you do that. We're also working on ways of combining plastics with actually mammalian cells, which could actually someday lead to uh, possibly creating new tissues or organs for people who have uh, various medical problems. For example, it's, this kind of principle is already being used to make new skin for burn sure. victims and. We're doing studies in our own lab, which someday might be helpful in making new spinal cords and things like that for people who are paralyzed. I see. So, so the field of research that you're involved in is, is basically what's called tissue engineering? Well, tissue engineering is one of the things that uh, our research involves. I, I'd say broadly what we're involved in are, are bioengineering, biomedical engineering, and, uh, and, and possibly the interface of, of materials and, and biotechnology. But tissue engineering is certainly sure. a, a big part of what we do. So for one to, um, to uh, have a career in what you do, it sounds like you can't specialize in one individual kind of uh, expertise. That you actually have to have some training in a, in a number of disciplines. What, what can you say about that? Well, I, I think you can have training in a single discipline, but then somehow you want to pick up the other ones. I mean, for myself, I actually had a training in chemical engineering, but I worked in a surgery lab when I was a postdoctoral fellow, and so I was able to learn some things about biology from that. And in my own lab, we, ha we do, we have people of about 10 different disciplines, but they work together and they collaborate uh, with each other. So chemists do certain things, uh, material scientists do certain things. We have a number of medical doctors, and so they all kind of work together. They all have their own projects, but there's a lot of interface. Now, do you, do you use uh, the new technologies, the nanotechnologies, are you? We do. We actually have a major uh, program that's funded by the National Cancer Institute in nanotechnology. Actually, nanotechnology aimed at, uh, at, at both cancer treatment and diagnosis. For example, one of the big projects that we have actually at MIT and, and Harvard Medical School is uh, can we make nanoparticles that could go right to the cancer cell and no other cell? And the, the key aspect of nanotechnology is you really do need to make the, the drug carrier small. Uh, if they're if they're bigger than 200 nanometers, they're not able to get into the cell. So by making them exactly the right size and then also doing the right kind of chemistry, what we're trying to do is direct it right to the cells that we want them to go to. And, and we're achieving some pretty good success. We've actually, in animal studies, uh, had, had some uh, very exciting results in treating prostate cancer in, in small animals. And so presumably by, by directing the, the compound exactly to the diseased area of the body, then you, then you minimize side effects or create a more potent drug? or Both. Or both. You're absolutely right. So the idea is that if you, you know, right now when people give cancer drugs are disseminated throughout the entire body, by using these nanotechnology approaches, we're trying to direct the drug right to just the cells you want, which could make it more effective, you know, sure. getting more drug there. And since it doesn't go to all the other places you don't want it to go to, it's going to be uh, theoretically much safer as well. Mm -hmm. Getting back to tissue in engineering or what, what we're calling tissue engineering, 
It seems to me like that would have some advantage over, as far as, you know, you hear when somebody has a kidney transplant that there are problems with immune rejection and so on and so forth. Are there similar kinds of issues with, uh, with engineered uh, tissues? There can be. I mean, I think the, the, the motivation for tissue engineering, there's a variety of strategies that people are using, but the biggest motivation, I suppose, is, is donor shortage. Uh, that, that, you know, so if one's dealing with, say, a liver transplant today, uh, the biggest uh, problem, and, and that's true for heart as well, one of the biggest problems is donor shortage. So this right. could potentially solve that problem. Then you're right, then you could run into the problem of immune rejection. But the clinicians I work with feel that, you know, they're already treating patients with liver failure with, uh, you know, immunosuppressive drugs. And mm -hmm. so you could still do that. Also, there's strategies in tissue engineering that may allow someday you to, to solve the issues of immune rejection as well. Some of the strategies involve uh, encapsulating cells so that sure. you wouldn't be able to have the immune cells uh, attack your, your cells. Uh, different strategies are being used. We're actually working on a number of them, and mm -hmm. I hope someday they'll, they'll really be able to help people. Some are already doing that. Like I say, the skin mm -hmm. is already, already approved, and there's some others in clinical trials, but there's a lot, lot more work to be done. Well, excellent. It sounds very exciting. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Think Forward. Think Research Channel.